action. We're recording. Good afternoon from the Bay Area and beyond. I'm Jason Putnam Gordon. I'm a venture capital attorney with Pulsinelli, and we are here today with Idea to IPO for today's event, which is the latest investment in innovation in health tech with three fantastic panelists who we had on actually back in February. It was a great panel, so I'm very excited today. Before we get started, let me share a little bit of background information about how today's panel is going to proceed. So first, we'll have the panel speak for about an hour. Uh, I'll ask them a number of questions. There will be some, because I know this panel, there will be some free-flowing conversation. It'll be very lively. If you've got questions, that's terrific. Please use the Q&A function. We'll track them, and then we may answer some of them a little bit during the panel discussion, but we'll focus for the last half hour on, uh, on answering those questions that you've asked. Now, a couple of caveats, as you may be able to tell, we are recording today's event. So the great news is that if you have registered, if you've missed some or all of it, or you haven't been able to join us, maybe because you're in a different time zone, that's not a problem. We will send it to you uh, afterwards. Uh, downside is don't say anything that is uh, confidential or technical information because it's going to be recorded for posterity and uh, you know transmitted perhaps forever. It'll last forever on the internet. Now. With that in mind, as I mentioned before, we've got three great panelists, Mary Grove, the managing partner at Bread and Butter Ventures, Gary Goldman, who's a doctor, who's a dentist, who's a VC, and the founder and principal of Global Health Impact Fund, and Ephraim Lindenbaum, managing director of Advanced Ventures. I'm going to let you tell them a little, I'm going to let them tell you a little bit about each of themselves and also, you know, their firm, their fund, and where they play. But before I do, Again, I'm Jason Putnam Gordon. I'm a venture capital and emerging growth company attorney at Pulsinelli. I work with health tech startups, so digital health, devices, diagnostics, and I'm pleased to be here uh, working with this panel today. So, with that in mind, maybe Mary, if you wouldn't mind kicking us off, telling us a little bit about yourself and your fund and the space that you play in, and then we'll pivot over after everyone's run around to talk about what's the latest and greatest. Terrific. Well, thank you, Jason, for having me. And it's great to be back with this panel. Had such a wonderfully fun time last time and look forward to, to doing it again today. So as Jason said, I'm Mary Grove. I'm managing partner at Bread and Butter Ventures. I'm coming to you live from Minneapolis, Minnesota, where we are headquartered. And we are an early stage firm investing specifically in seed stage companies all across the country. And we can invest internationally as well in what we believe are the bread and butter sectors of the modern economy moving forward. So roughly speaking, how we feed ourselves, how we care for one another and how we work. So specifically prioritizing food tech, health tech and enterprise SaaS as our core three verticals. And then our, our strategy is to partner with the strong corporate backbone here in Minnesota, which you know, if you're not from here and not familiar, you may not know that Truly, these multi-trillion dollar global industries are deeply rooted with epicenters here in Minnesota. So think about Cargill, Ecolab, General Mills, Schwann's Food Company, Hormel, you know, Target, 3M, United Health Group, Mayo Clinic, Medtronic. Uh, I could really go on and on. We have the highest number of Fortune 500s per capita in the country. So our strategy is to leverage those, the strengths of those titans of industry to help fuel the growth of our early stage portfolio. We have 45 companies in our portfolio today. We're currently investing out of our third fund. And then from a uh, sort of stage size perspective, we typically invest you know, half a million dollars into the first check on average uh, into seed stage companies and then have reserves for follow on and whatnot. So my personal background prior to building bread and butter with our fantastic team, most recently I was an investment partner at Revolution on the rise of the rest seed fund focused specifically on investing outside of the non-coastal hubs of Silicon Valley, New York, and Boston, which ironically is where I've spent my whole career prior to the last few years. And so uh, that was a fantastic experience. I focused a lot on our health tech investing, enterprise SaaS, future of work, marketplaces, some FinTech. And then to back it up further, I started my career at Google where I spent the first 15 years worked on the IPO deal team when the company went public, which was a fascinating time did early stage product biz dev for about six years. And I built the Google for startups organization my last six years. So the common theme you'll see there is I deeply love working with companies at the early stage. I firmly believe that it's not just happening in Silicon Valley, even though 
was fortunate to work and live there for almost two decades. And uh, looking forward to chatting trends in health tech. I do, I should note that I lead our health tech investing within bread and butter. Well, thank you very much, Mary. We are delighted to have you back. Um, maybe, I think F uh, disappeared maybe for a moment. Gary, if you could tell us a little bit about yourself and your, your fund. Sure, happy to. Um, yeah, so I have 35 years in, of clinical experience in healthcare, started as a dentist and a physician, uh, transitioned to the Bay Area in 1989. I'm a serial entrepreneur. I've had three digital healthcare companies over since that time, since 1989. Uh, most recent was Modio Health, which is a cloud-based provider data management and credentialing platform that exited about a year and a half for a hefty amount of money. Um, I'm also an uh, informaticist for Sutter Health, a uh, 27 health, uh, hospital system in, in the Northern California area. Um, so because of all that, I had an opportunity to travel around and find out how to disenfranchise my mission in life moving forward was to create a network and venture fund, which was clinician funded, founded and managed. Um, so we started out with a venture fund, uh, Global Health Impact Fund, which we started about three years ago now. We've raised, you know, pretty much close to $10 million, made 10 in, uh, investments, and we're closing fund one. We're about to start a second individual member fund for around the same $10 million, but we're also uh, creating a uh, institutional round that'll be 20 to $30 million. And in the background, we've created a clinician-driven uh, network which works closely with the fund to promote active participation of clinicians in the digital health revolution. We dem we're democratizing the investment process for the clinicians to get involved and invest in startups and healthcare, pretty much focused on digital health, which is still a pretty broad concept, um, but then also, also involve them in the, the due diligence process um, um, as active mentors and advisors and consultants for the companies that we invest in. Sorry. Let me just get rid of this. <laughs> okay, sorry. Um, and so our, our clinicians are actively involved in every part of the investment process and post-investment acceleration of our companies. We've also recently created an accelerator with a, with a partner, um, a global capital partner. So um, yeah, that's what we do. Wonderful. And last but certainly not least, F, tell us a little bit about yourself and Advanced Ventures as well. Thank you, Jason. Great to join a phenomenal panel with some amazing colleagues as well. So my name is Ephraim Lindenbaum. I'm the Managing Director of Advanced Ventures. We are a historic uh, Silicon Valley venture fund founded in 1999. So as you can imagine, we've gone through a number of waves here in Silicon Valley. We invest across technology, health, and wellness, which for us, us means traditional information technology focused predominantly today on fintech. Uh, health, meaning digital health, as well as food and nutrition, and wellness, which includes many of the food, nutritious, plant-based meats. You may have run into some of our products out in the field in, in elements like iPhones or even, uh, you know, Beyond Meat burgers or, uh, you know, beverages like Uba, Khalifa Farms, etc. So, you know, we're very much inside of many, many, many products out there today. Uh, we've invested now through three uh, successive venture vehicles. We're investing out of of a fourth managed co-fund today. And I'm a recovering entrepreneur. So I sat on the other, other side of the table with most of the folks that'll be on the call today. You know, I built a company in Silicon Valley uh, since I was too young to know better, grew that through the 90s and uh, actually got ready to go public ourselves in 1998. And a, a big M&A offer came in and we took that and were able to deliver the outcome for my employees and my investors at that time. And, you know, it's somewhat binary in Silicon Valley when you exit here, you either start your next company or become an investor. I like to joke, I didn't have any great ideas at the time, but really had a great team at Advanced Ventures. We've spun up and, you know, we've been really lucky. We've had an exit about every 18 months since the beginning of our fund. And we're very excited about our current portfolio, which includes companies like Mycotechnologies, a leader in plant-based uh, uh, proteins, for example, Alpha Foods. If you go to your local store, you can pick up Alpha plant-based food products as one of the fastest growing CPGs out there, all the way into uh, companies like Pathogen DX, which is pivoting to focusing on the number one tracking for COVID variants out there. So, you know, we're really excited. We're moving the needle as well as just building great companies there. 
Fantastic. Well, again, we are excited to have each of you here today. Let me tell you a little bit about who's in the room. So just taking, I'm going to share these results and just taking a quick look. So we've got a, about 25% of the people are here in the Bay Area and then a, a strong contingent of folks in the rest of the US. So probably in the aggregate, that's probably about six, six 70% right now. But again, we're global at this point and everything's being recorded. And, and so there are folks who are registered all over, the, all over the world and they may be sleeping right now and they'll catch it uh, after we distribute this. I'm proud um, to be representing elsewhere in the United States. <laughs> right, right. And that's why we were so glad to have you here, Mary. That way it's not just a bunch of talking heads from the Bay Area. Um, so thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, but, you know, and in line with that, uh, we've got, you know, some folks from Europe, some folks from Asia, and uh, some from Africa and Australia in the room, which is terrific. In terms of sort of a breakdown of the flavor for the room, we've got about a third of the room is first-time entrepreneurs, 15% serial entrepreneurs, 30% early stage startups, 12% uh, growth stage. We've got some folks from academia, some folks in government, 10% uh, of angel investors and some VCs, whether they are corporate or traditional venture capitalists. So exciting panel, exciting audience. Let's hop right into the meat of things. Uh, if you've got a, a question, please use the Q&A function, but hopping into the meat of things. Open question for the panel. Can you catch us up sort of in the last 12 to six months or so of what we're seeing in the, in the health tech space? and how, where, where we're kind of headed coming out, at least here in the US probably, of, of COVID and the pandemic. Yeah, certainly. I mean, I think it, you know, we've done a, a panel on this, I think a number of times, Jason, uh, even with these colleagues online. And, you know, I think it's evolved quite a bit. I think the first piece that we view is it exposed a, a tremendous amount of weak spots within our entire healthcare system, uh, whether that be supply chain, care, et cetera. You know, it really kicked off a, a very, uh, you know, uh, what had been a very slow adoption curve in telehealth and telemedicine uh, and really brought that into the forefront. It, you know, forced people to get comfortable, forced uh, a very slow moving, slow adopting medical system to embrace much of this new technology. And I think now we sit and we wait and we see how much of that will continue to survive. You know, who are going to, you know, sort of evolve as the winners within that capacity. You know, we were very lucky uh, in, in, in an exit with a telehealth company right before COVID and uh, through their private equity fund, uh, a second bite at that apple in the middle of COVID. But, uh, you know, certainly the case. I think, I think we're taking a big pause in terms of our digital health. You know, unless it's something like our diagnostics where we know it immediately dies. In. I think I think we're waiting for a little bit of the dust to clear. I'll hop in there as well and just say, you know, it's been it's been a extremely active last year all across the board in many sectors, but particularly in health and in digital health, just the acceleration of the pace of new company starts, but new companies uh, getting funded, and I think more firms who are generalist in nature, shifting some of their allocation and attention into the healthcare space specifically. And then the big recurrent themes that we hear both from the industry side, meaning who are the potential large clients of some of these solutions, uh, and then from the early stage side, uh, some of the themes that I've touched upon, right? Of course, we see we know the explosion of telehealth, and the competition there, related technologies like remote patient monitoring, can't tell you how many uh, dozens of companies we've seen pop up in that space in the last six months, more attention and capital, which I'm thrilled to see towards female health broadly as a vertical, many, many subcategories within that. Um, it's about time. And then just infrastructure generally, right? The in infrastructure, the, the nuts and bolts of everything from um, approvals to payments to the, the whole nine yards. And so I would say as an early stage investor at the earliest stage, it's gotten a lot more competitive and one needs to be a lot more discerning on differentiation because it is very crowded with a lot of players in every category. But overall, very exciting time. And, and um, I think we'll see a lot more activity in the coming year. Yeah, I'm, I'll jump in as well. You know, I'll provide a little bit of a different perspective from the clinician side of things. It's, it's actually quite fascinating because when we started our fund, which, as I said earlier, was a clinician driven fun and funded uh, um, organization, 
uh, adoption into the areas that we were in, investing in, uh, in telehealth and remote patient monitoring and devices was very slow. Um, and even when we were dealing with the clinicians, as an informaticist, I have inroads into virtually every large institution to talk to the decision makers on the clinical side, but it was still moving at a snail's pace. And then all of a sudden, you know, I, I, I almost jokingly talk about this is that, you know, although it was a horrible black cloud and, and of course all the negative aspects of the pandemic, but digital health and venture capital have benefited significantly. We've almost accelerated digital health by five years in, in a year and a half because of it. And it's because like any other business, when you go from making something elective to making it mandatory, it changes your business model significantly. So a lot of the companies that we were working with um, that were portfolio companies already, all of a sudden um, really were overwhelmed with the, the needs of their solutions moving forward. And then as the, you know, when I take my clinical hat off and put my venture capital hat on, um, all of a sudden those investments, which we weren't sure what direction where they were gonna go, where that exit was gonna happen five, seven years, became a very different um, approach for us. And on our network side of our organization, which again is re represents clinicians, represents uh, decision makers, you know, C-suite leaders in 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 the enterprise uh, sector, there they were all of a sudden clamoring for these solutions because it was the only way to continue providing care. And then, of course, the last part of it is the revenue generation, right? So, so when we talk about the revenue model, because of the pandemic, a lot of a lot of technology that was on the on 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 the on the border of whether it was actually ever going to be compensated for all of those rules changed immediately which made um those investments and and the companies that we were looking at much more viable from an investment and valuation perspective thank you so uh, um I guess maybe one question I want to try and drill into a little bit more, and I think maybe F and you, Mary, talked about this. And so last last time we as a panel had a discussion about this, telehealth, remote patient monitoring, were just lots of capital was getting deployed in there, and now you know, be, sort of reading between the lines a little bit, you know, if investors are being, if you will, a little more cautious or discerning. Is there, is there any little bit of a pullback on that that you see happening? Or is it just th that sector is kind of starting to mature a little bit more given that there have been so many investments that are made? Well, I, you know, I think, I think we we're dealing with a scenario where we had a market on fire, right? And we saw a number of health systems and even uh, you know, extended traditional uh, PCP organizations you know, go ahead and adopt technology. And I think, you know, very rapidly, often, uh, you know, without a lot of diligence, you know, whereas we had a historic, you know, digital health company, uh, you know, one of the early leaders called SnapMD in the space, they worked with everybody, they, they climbed the very slow train up the mountain in terms of adoption. You know, we saw other players kind of come in, jump in, get a lot of early traction, and now we're seeing people that are, you know, being sort of uh, pulled out of systems uh, right mm -hmm. now. Uh, you know, what, what, you know, I will tell you what is blowing up my Zoom today is the fact that uh, there was a health visit that I did online with a flaky piece of software, which I won't tell you, which has now blown up my sound card and I've restarted my machines 10 times. So, you know, I think these health systems are very quickly understanding that, you know, there is a value in making sure tech is solid uh, you know, they, they were trying to, using a, a, a word from the medical industry, triage, a very difficult, you know, situation. They needed to kind of get, and, and I heard this recently from a, a chief medical officer, they were trying to get a tourniquet on a very <laughs> big bleeding yeah. wound. And, yeah. you know, now that they're in a position where, you know, it's stabilized, they're in the ER, they have access to all their tools, and they're sitting back, and they're really saying, wait a second, you know, does this really integrate? You know, does it integrate with billing? Does it integrate with insurance? Does it integrate? Do they have CMS codes? Whereas, you know, beforehand, you know, a lot of these uh, decisions were made on the fly, not through traditional uh, steering committees. And, you know, we have a situation today where, you know, 
one of the folks we know, uh, you know, they didn't have a CMS code. And for those of those of you out there, that that's a billing code. And without a proper biller code, you know, it's very challenging. And you know, I've worked with with Jason's firm, works with a number of our startups, and in particular, they worked. You know, this is a historic startup, and they worked with the right, you know, legislative a, a team at a firm like Pozzanelli to to make sure all the I's were dotted and T's were crossed. <laughs> And, and they're on, on a very solid long-term trajectory, part of Operation Warp Speed. And it's very different when you see kind of the Silicon Valley throw it at the wall and stick versus a company that's, you know, doing it the right way, get their CMS codes, has the right, you know, legislative components and, and are really moving toward a long-term exit. Well, thank you, F, uh, for, that, for that answer. Yeah, and, Carl, and Carl also Jason, for the plug. he's got a great team. Uh, but 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 if I if I could maybe sort of reflect on what you said and sort of synthesize it with Gary, if this is accurate, it sounded like there was a lot of activity and pressure kind of in the in the investment community and deployment in, you know by VCs because you know they were seeing a lot of activity that was being forced onto these you know uh, provider uh, provider systems and now now that that is sort of settling and um, the providers are realizing you, you can't just plug anything in and get it to work. Um, the market is sort of dictating kind of where the winners or losers are going to shake out and, and also demanding higher quality potentially. And that's going to affect sort of the long-term landscape of this and also where de capital is going to get deployed moving forward. Is that I think that's right? a great assessment. Great assessment. And, you know, it's really zeroing in on those big challenges that were exposed to a large degree in the space. You know, I, you know uh, those of us on the VC love to call out the word disruption. Uh, the medical and health industry does not like the word disruption. They they like the word you know calculated you know effective solid things like that. Lawyers are kind of in that bucket too, I think. I'll just I'll just add that you know I think that for those who are investing in the health tech space, the aperture has broadened in the last year, and you you start to see the intersection of whether it's fintech and health tech, or in our case, ag tech and health tech, there's a lot of overlapping opportunity that's not just focused on, on human health. So a couple examples of companies we've invested in, you know, one is called EIO Diagnostics that's tracking and treating um, mastitis in cows, for example. And so you see a lot of firms who are thinking, well, how big is my, my pool of opportunity within health more broadly, animal health and wellness, um, GenCove is one of our portfolio companies that they do, you know, low pass genome sequencing be began with the ag tech vertical now expanding to the human health use case. And so it's sort of both, I think it's as in the investor seat, it's, it's caused us to also just widen that lens of when you think about health, what are the different opportunities that are even beyond what we've imagined? Because when something like a COVID-19 pandemic hits, you know, you want to be, you want to be ahead of the curve in terms of where, where the next, you know, major billion dollar opportunity is. Yeah, Jason, Jason, I apologize. I blacked out here for a bit, so I missed, missed part of it. One of the things that I will say with respect to what I caught was that, you know, there's the upside, but there's also the downside. And we see this in venture capital a lot, is that once the, the shift of focus on where the money is, where the attention is, everybody starts jumping into that sector no matter who they are and it reminds me of the first time i went to hymns it's like you go there and there's two football fields of companies that are all working on the same technology but they're in the same building and they don't even know who they are so uh, from a clinician perspective we're almost recreating um an electronic healthcare record environment yet again and 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 that worries me a bit because now i'm seeing a lot of opportunities for, for investments across 12 different companies that are doing very similar things. And our network tries to promote collaboration, which is not easy in this space. Oh, th thank you, Gary. And, and F, I would be interested also in your perspective, because I know that you, you do a lot of work in ag tech as well. And if you're seeing some of the same things that Mary is seeing in terms of the convergence between those two spaces. You know, I, I think to a degree, I mean, our, our, our diagnostic company, Pathogen DX, you know, was predominantly focused in ag and food because it is a much quicker entry point than human diagnostics. 
uh, you know, they, they were asked to join Operation Warp Speed. So, you know, certainly they were pulled in. They had the, the you know, deep bench on the R&D and the science side to move forward from there. So I think that's very meaningful. I mean, Mary's spot on. Look, ag is great. We we were one of the first true ag tech investors in 2001. So I probably have the, the bumps and bruises to go with it. You know, we, we, we really focused after doing digital, you know, a lot of animal health and other types of ag investments to really focusing in on what we view as, you know, some of the, the big problems, right? Plant, uh, you know, alternative proteins, fermentation, uh, CPG brands right now. Not to say that, that, that all of the things that Mary is, is talking about is very, very important. Uh, you know, her particular vantage point, uh, you know, coming out of that upper Midwest is the right place to be doing a lot of this stuff she's doing. I mean, our, our goal is to connect with people like Mary who are hands-on spending time with these great new startups, you know, as they, they generate meaningful traction, as we can see that broadening out, uh, you know, then, then certainly, you know, those are, those are the kind of, you know, if you will, club sport opportunities we look for in venture. You know, I sit on the board with, you know, Tyson Ventures and Bungie and, you know, uh, uh, many, many other giant folks that, you know, were board members for, you know, five years together. You know, I'm waiting for someone like Mary, and I'm sure she will come to me with one of these great companies that, that has that connection, her connections, our connections all together. And, you know, two plus two equals three kind of, you know, or five, if you will, or six, or who knows, uh, great, great opportunities. I'll call you. I'm looking forward to it. I'm looking forward to it. You know, I mean, there, you know, this, this is a club sport. I mean, you know, it, it, it's the ability to find the great companies all over and, you know, great investors like Mary and her team find great companies that, you know, we'll never see in Minnesota. But, you know, I will tell you, uh, you know, a large portion of our portfolio today is outside of Silicon Valley. We're very, you know, Denver is a hotbed for us, uh, Arizona as well. Uh, so, you know, from our standpoint, we even have a, you know, a, U a U.S. and Canadian play. So from our standpoint, it's it's much, much less geographic based unless you're in a couple of categories, right? If you're doing an AI tech company or a semiconductor company or a, you know, enterprise software company, I mean, Silicon Valley does have its advantages. But if you're in ag tech, you know, there's no reason why you should be in, you know, Palo Alto, <laughs> honestly. I'll just add to that, you know, the view from the ground here and keep in mind, I, I spent the first two decades of my career in Silicon Valley. I 100% I agree that, you know, we're, we're seeing a, a large shift that we were seeing, frankly, pre-pandemic, but the Zoom effect has definitely accelerated the democratization of access to capital. And we, we had that we had that thesis already, right, that great companies can be built anywhere. We, Bread and Butter Ventures, are in Minnesota. We don't invest exclusively in Minnesota by any means. About 20, 24% of our portfolio are based in Minnesota. 41% uh, are in the Midwest, and the rest are pretty well distributed, to give you a sense. But one phenomenon that I am certainly seeing, and this is across the board in the sectors we invest, including health, we have such a strong preemptive interest in non-coastal companies from the large coastal funds. And, and like you said about, you know, it's a, it's a team sport. Uh, it's a phenomenon that's happening again and again, right? Of the second we close the seed round, the Series A investors begin knocking on the doors and preempting and building those relationships at the valuations are beginning to shift significantly for non-coastal deals. And I think that's a trend we'll continue to see. Um, I am delighted when, you know, whenever capital flows inland, whether it's a firm moves here, a firm is created here, or firms look here for deal flow. And, you know, we're happy to be a part of, it's critical to us, the, the vast majority of, not the vast, but a large amount of my time that I spend with companies post-investment is on fundraising support, right? For the A, the B, we have one raising a series C now. And it's critical to have these large firms who can support um, those rounds of growth. And so I'm happy to hear you say that. So, so staying on that topic uh, for the moment, and then I do want to shift actually something that we talked about the last time that we were together. But, but Gary, what, what are you seeing in terms of you know, access to startups beyond the Bay Area across the U.S. and maybe internationally, if you're still with I us? Apologize. Yeah. Jason, I apologize to you. We're, the whole signal is going in and out. I'm not sure what's going on with my Zoom, but I'm okay. missing half of this. So, but oh, oh no problem. Well, I mean, if you want to maybe just try and restart, I mean, you can come back in. That might be the best thing to do. If the, yeah, okay, I will do that. All right, yeah, thank you. We'll give that a shot. Um, so it's a shame we're going to lose Gary, at least for a few minutes. But I think one of the pain points that we had sort of talked about, you know, in the health tech space the last time we were together was 
you know, aside from the tremendous sort of shock and loss that the pandemic has brought across, you know, people in the U.S. and then elsewhere in the world, one of the things it's also done is really tied up FDA resources um, and sort of maybe slowed the ability for some companies to make progress if they are not specifically COVID related. Are you still seeing that? Are you still, you know, are your portfolio companies still being affected by that? How are entrepreneurs kind of building that into their business plan and model, you know, to be credit, you know, credibly addressed when, you know, they're being reviewed by UVCs? Yeah, I mean, it's a great point um, that, that, that we're seeing out there, Jason. Uh, you know, we've seen on the therapeutic side, potentially an 18 to 36 month pushback. I mean, and this is terrible because although we, we, we tend to be less invested there, our friends are very invested there and our co-investors. And, you know, there's, there's a whole backlog of phenomenal new therapeutics for cancer and others that are just incredibly tied up. You know, diagnostics, especially on what we call the 510 side is a little bit looser. Um, you know, I think what's democratizing this a little bit is, you know, startups and VCs understanding that there is a process. You know, there's always been a bit of a swashbuckling Silicon Valley model associated with this. You know, some of the large biotech VCs uh, have been clued into this for a while. But it's still quite new, you know, understanding the, you know, DC process of being able to get through, navigate, et cetera, is something that, you know, we've really only seen over the last, I'd call it three to five years. Um, and particularly on the diagnostic and, you know, when you talk about th therapeutics and ultimately digital health. First, there wasn't much guidance until the last couple of years. Second issue is being able to drill through the guidance and, you know, not to just give you a plug per se, because there are a lot of folks on K Street and the lobbyists in D.C., but, you know, having a friend in D.C. Uh, that can help you navigate is worth as much as a great, you know, biz dev employee in our opinion, right? Mm -hmm. You know, we've seen companies go in and do a deal with Mayo Clinic and, oh, my God, that's going to boost our valuation and, you know, a year and a half later, they're doing 10,000, 20,000 a month of business with them. I've seen a company go in, spend $10,000 a month with a great, you know, legal uh, consulting team in DC and generate 10x that, maybe even 100x that per month because they've got through, they've navigated it, they've got their CMS codes, they've gotten their 510. They've known who to talk to within an FDA cycle, uh, you know, and this also goes for USDA. So I'm sure Mary could speak to it as well. Um, you know, being able to navigate Washington is becoming more and more interesting and it's no longer left coast, right coast thing. You know, we are squarely in the heart, you know, so number one, you need great corporate counsel. And number two, you need great, if you're going to have a regulated business, you need to have great legislation and, and regulatory counsel. Thanks, Jeff. I mean, you know, kind of at the heart of it, it it's, and I'm going to let, this is maybe going to be a segue for Mary, because I think you, you've handled a, a similar question before so well, right? But VCs have a job to do, which involves getting returns on the investment that their investors make. And so there's got to be a path and a plan for that. Um, and so one, that 18 to 36 month pushback is a significant one, right? And Mary, maybe you can talk sort of about um, the time horizon of VC investors and also, um, you know, what, what an 18 to 36 month pushback might look like or how that might get accounted for. Um, and then also kind of why CMS, right, and other payer issues is so critical. Sure, absolutely. So a quick little venture 101 of, you know, how, how are VCs funds structured? How do we make money? What are our expectations? And how do we best partner with entrepreneurs is the ultimate question. But venture capital, I love to say, is not, it's but one form of capitalizing a company. So if you're building a company, it's important to understand what are your goals, what are the timelines associated with your business, and then what's the proper way to capitalize it. And so VC is really specific to companies who are looking for you know, high growth, exponential growth trajectory with a goal of having a liquidation event. So specifically, that's either you know, an M&A event or going public, right? And so when, when VCs invest, we, the fund managers, 
have raised money from LPs or limited partners for the investors putting capital to work into our funds. And their expectation in ours is that we're going to return that capital to them at a multiple times, hopefully above what they what they put in. So when we are raising our own funds and pitching that, you know, our expectation is we are going to see exits and return capital in plus or minus seven years, but less than 10 years, right? Somewhere in between that six to 10 year time horizon. And so we're looking for to make investments. Every single company we invest in generally, but we believe is a billion dollar potential opportunity. These are not designed to, you know, sell and, and 2X, let's say within two to three years, that's a different style of investing. And there's an appropriate way, way to do that as well. So it's just, there's a lot of, I think, you know, press and headlines around the venture back startups. It seems like it's so ubiquitous everywhere, but I think it's a very, very specific, very effective, high risk, high reward style of investing that is part of a portfolio approach. And that's how we're able to be successful, you know, we hope, um, is in having that portfolio style approach. And so when you apply that to, to your question, Jason, about regulatory holdups and delays, for, for devices in general and regulated businesses, there are very specific types of firms that invest in those sectors. Or your generalist firm, or you see a lot of digital health specific investors, and that's you know investing in the software side or tech enabled non-regulated hardware side. And that's a, the expectation there is what I just described. For investors who are gonna go deep into the med, med device sector, the expectation is longer, uh, truly. It's not, you know if the horizon to get approval is, is seven years, we're not going to see a liquidation event in seven years, right? An exit. And so it's important to align yourself well with investors who have the same expectation as you. And for some firms, it's just a non-starter, right? Period. But some are beginning to experiment. And so I would, I would advise really make sure there's alignment around what the goals are, what the expectations are, what the timeline is. And, and I think, um, but honestly, I, I do think just the everyday vernacular now of everyone knowing Pfizer and Moderna and these were investments that have been made, you know, not overnight, not in 18 month period. And so I do think there is a lot more open-mindedness about we've got to make some long-term investments and how do we deal with that from a, from a returns perspective in the near term. Thank you, Mary. G Gary, I see you're back. Um, better, better reception. Different computer. <laughs> <laughs> it, I went to my laptop and it's much better. Thank you. Oh, great, great, great. Uh, yeah. I didn't know if you have anything to add or maybe anything yeah, well, earlier in our conversation. Yeah. Well, just listening to, to, to Mary's input right now, what's interesting, so, you know, we're not the typical venture fund. It's interesting to, to listen, you know, I mean, I got into this from the clinical side of, of it from a venture perspective, but the thesis of our venture fund has always been, you know, again, around digital health, but also to look at the portfolio companies in a synergistic way, because we leverage a lot of what we do on the network side of our fund. So we have invested in several digital device companies. But again, our process is to identify what we believe in a very early stage of development technologies that from a clinical perspective, if successful, would be market disrupting technologies. You know, we have one in the maternal fetal monitoring space, which is revolutionary. It changes the way we monitor babies, eliminates, you know, reduces C-sections. We have another one as an anesthesiologist, which is a blood pressure monitoring device that literally will ultimately be able to be deployed in a watch and beat to beat blood pressures as accurate as an invasive arterial line. So these are real changing technologies that also I've learned that when I start to look at those kind of companies, I look at them as a device company, but I also look at them as a data company, right? Because we're collecting data now from a clinical perspective that we've never been able to collect. And then we've also, between machine learning and AI, we have ways to from a more easy, an easier perspective for the clinician, evaluate that information in, in an assisted intelligence way that makes sense for the clinicians and makes them more efficient in taking care of, of the patients. And for us, when we look at those companies also, Mary, 
you know, yes, potentially their, their exit cycle is very long, like a pharma company. But what we're starting to see is because if you can pick the right market disrupting technologies, they're never getting to commercialization. They're going to be acquired by a GE or a Philips or a Medtronics. Because and and most and the other last part of it, which is also interesting from our perspective, is again we tend to lean towards innovators and entrepreneurs that are clinicians. Now that's a very different group of individuals than somebody that comes from med tech or pharma because they need a lot more pre, intra, and post investment support just on the management side of things. So we found that's also where our network becomes very valuable for them because we've created an ecosystem that's almost like a post investment accelerator. So because they need the support and most of those CEOs are not likely to survive as the CEO of that company within a year or two or maybe three because they just don't have the right acumen to run the company. So our approach tends to be less typical from a healthcare digital uh, investment perspective because we take all of those pieces into consideration as clinicians. Yeah, I think that's that's fantastic. So <clears throat> I guess one, one question that I have for you, Gary, is you know, what, what are some of the trends that you were sort of seeing in terms of um, where these clinician entrepreneurs are kind of heading? You know, how has the pandemic shaped many, maybe some of how some of what they've where they want to head, some some of the opportunities that might be out there that were not either tackled before or or we're not anybody's radar before. Right. Well, and I think I kind of alluded to this earlier, and it, it certainly, I'll use a medical term, metastasizes in, into the digital innovation space for clinical innovators, is that early on pre-pandemic, the, the innovators that we would look at were clearly subject matter expert KOLs in their area. So it's a cardiologist or an intensivist in inventing something that improves their workflow or their ability to take care of patients. And that to me is very enticing because if you can pick the right individual with the right idea clinically and then help them in the early stages and accelerate it, the success rate's very high. But now we're starting to see that bubble phenomenon where now post pandemic, everybody sees the dollar signs and there's a lot of clinician clinicians that are trying to get into the telemedicine space and building networks of clinicians and providing services mm -hmm. better than telemed or you know better than American Well. Um, and there is a root, there is a space for that because actually our network is focusing focusing in on that. You know, right now telemedicine is probably where EHRs were, you know, eight, 10, 12 years ago. It's very rudimentary. It's not specialty specific. The workflow is not designed. Why should a dermatologist be using the same solution as an obstetrician? It just doesn't make any sense. Well, so, so, so wait, wait, Gary, that's a killer point. I want to just touch on that because there are companies that have point solutions that have modules for that. And the great part is you as not only an investor, one of the smartest guys I know who's got more degrees than I can imagine, and <laughs> an investor in the space isn't immediately aware that there are telehealth companies with modules already on the backbone to support each of those specialties and insurance billing and CMS codes and everything else tells me that this, you know, that frames to me you know, a really disparate space, right? And what it says to me is, if you're the, you know, to me, you're the, I would come to you to get a, a gut check on something like this. And, and, you know, and if they haven't gotten to you, they're, you know, it's, that's just how disparate and how, you know, challenged the space broadly is. Because, you know, you know, if, if Gary's looking at it, like, I didn't see that, they're doing a lousy job because they should have got to Gary first because he's one of those guys that is the influencer. Well, thank you, Ep. I, I mean, I appreciate that. I'll respond, if you don't mind, Mary, just real quickly, is that, um, you know, it's, it's, it's interesting because we've actually, you know, because we have a fund and we have a network, we will tend to even incubate ideas that we think are the right thing to do from within our network, some of which are our investors. So we're actually, we've created a telemedicine 2.0 initiative, which is doing exactly that as a fund we're going out and identifying those 
more granular specialty specific solutions, which are looking at a more multidisciplinary approach to the provision of care. It involves RPM and CCM and revenue cycle management and workflow where the electronic healthcare record is customized for that workflow, but tying it all together. You know, I, I just have to tell this story real quick. I tell it all the time is that when I first realized that this had to happen was, so my wife is a high risk obstetrician. And the first, when the pandemic first started, I walked into our bedroom and she was literally sitting in front of three different computers. And I said, Jenna, what are you doing? And she says to me, well, here's Zoom, which is not secure. Here's Epic, which won't allow me to be on the same computer because I'm you know, VPN into the UCSF system to use Zoom. And then I need another computer because they won't let me do my research on that computer. So she had three computers. And my wife is, is not the most tech savvy person. She's brilliant. But I was in, impressed that she could even get the three computers all working simultaneously. And the minute that I saw that, I realized that part of our mission as a network would be to start creating an aspect of our network that invested in companies and then started to look at the synergies between them and offer up a model where now as an organization, whether it's a practice or a large HCO, you could go in and say, okay, well, what our need right now is we need a virtual ICU solution. But the solution is a collaboration of several different solutions that create that multidisciplinary. Otherwise, it because creates the same nightmare we have with electronic healthcare records. So, so you're spot on on that. Gary, I have a question for you. you know, I love, love the model and the focus specifically of, of backing teams who have clinical experience or clinicians as founders. Can you speak a bit to over their growth cycle, um, do they maintain active practicing? Are they part-time on the business? How do you staff up the rest of the management team? What do you see there from, a, from an executive team trajectory? Yeah, I smile a little bit because it's a great question. And you're talking to somebody who's played that game three times now. It's not an easy balance to maintain your clinical, your clinical practice while you're building a company. But at the same time, it's incredibly valuable. Um, it's like electronic healthcare records. When we sit as informaticists, if I'm talking to an informaticist who hasn't practiced for 10 years, that's worthless to me because they don't understand what the problems are at the point of care. You know, what makes me efficient or less efficient as a clinician. So when you have a CEO that has generated, let's say it's a platform solution versus a pharmacology solution if, or a surgical, you know, assist solution, it's very important that they're clinically active, but you're very right. That very advantage is a huge disadvantage when you take your clinical hat off and start putting on your venture capital slash, you know, advisor mentor for the company because they don't have the right acumen and they need the focus. If I'm going to give you $1.5 million, I, when I call you on Monday, I don't want to hear that you're doing, you know, a big craniotomy in the operating room for eight hours because that means you're not focusing on the company. So we make it very clear early on, as a matter of fact, it's a perfect example, I won't throw out names, but there's a perfect example of a pharma solution that we're looking at in the macular degeneration space for ophthalmology, very smart CEO, good business person, great idea, but busier practice than I've seen in a long time. And it's been made very clear that he's not going to be the person to really take the company to the next stage and that will have to take like a chief medical officer position and founder in the company. So if you set those parameters early on, I think it's okay. But for every one of those individuals, you find individuals that say, well, it's my idea. I have to run the company. And that's, that's the ones we don't invest in because that's, that's an obstacle. You have to know as a CEO, as we all know, to step aside and, and let what needs to happen happen. And that's if, you, if you're going through FDA, you know, the FDA process, you need someone who has done that before, not someone who has never done it before, because it is a complicated process. So absolutely, when we look at companies that early on, we make it very clear, and we can get away with it probably a little bit easier because we're clinicians as well. So it tends to be taken less as an obstructive approach and more of as a you know, constructive criticism. So yeah, I hope that answers your question. Great, Great insights. Thank you. No, no, it doesn't. And just to sort of dovetail off of this, and, and maybe Mary, you, you have some insight, but um, you know, that, that's, 
if you're a founder, right, for those, for those who are listening and who are founders, right, one, one concern very early on is that, you know, they may be sort of ousted uh, from their startup. And that's not necessarily the only path that, you know, uh, that the startup role or that they may play in the startup. So, you know, as you said, a CMO position is a great sort of, um, you know, a great place potentially for that very busy founder who still wants to have a practice. But there are other roles for other founders. And I wonder, you know, whether you've you've seen any trends, Mary or F, or kind of how how is it the, that that issue presents itself and sort of works itself out in a positive way for all the players? In Mary, sure. I mean, I think you. It's not even specific to this vertical, right? It's no, the, there are definite specific considerations here, but there is, there's often the CEO who takes it from zero to a million dollar business to $10 million business is different from the one who takes it to the hundred million dollar level and beyond. And you see these very natural transitions that can occur. Um, we've, we've seen everything from, you know, takes a chair, a chairperson role and is more advisory and non-operational to takes a CXO fill in your blank there role and focuses on a specific part of the business. And I'll give you one of the greatest examples in, in tech history company. I was lucky to be at, you know, for 15 years, Google, right? Larry Page and Sergey Brin were our very product engineering genius co-founders. Eric Schmidt came in to lead the business as CEO for, and their agreement was actually out the gate that they were going to work together for 20 years, which held true. And then, you know, Eric became the chairman. And so, so there are a lot of scenarios outside of just health health care specifically where that's the case. But I do think too, and that's why I was so eager to get Gary's feedback, someone who's who's executed on this multiple times, you know, we, we believe as well that having that direct clinical experience is so is so paramount. But there are often other skills that, you know, how do we complement, augment? And I think your point is spot on about setting setting expectation or having an open conversation out the gate. And so it's never about ousting. It's, it's never the intention. And we see this again across many different businesses of maybe I've, I grow this to series B and someone else takes it to the IPO stage in that seat. So it's a very natural progression. And I think the biggest thing for founders is self-awareness. And it's not a bad thing at all. It's just self-awareness about where's my core skill set and how do I want to spend my time? How am I most effective? I mean, one of the things that I've observed, and F, I'd be interested in, in your um, observations too, but, you know, entrepreneurship, taking a company from zero to 10 million, as you, as you said, is, is a very different skill set than taking it from a hundred million to a billion. And some people are very happy, you know, with that entrepreneurial mindset of starting something from scratch. And they, they find if they can, once they get past a certain threshold, like they're not, they're not in their happy spot anymore. And um, I see that all the time. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, you know, look, I, I think we're a little little further upstream than Mary in terms of where we invest. So, you know, we do like to look at companies where we're going to have founders that are going to take it to the finish line in some C level. As Mary said, maybe that C insert letter XO kind of, you know, dynamic there. Uh, we've seen a lot, you know, Google's a great example. These are founders with, a, with an operating executive that got together and made a plan early on. I am not a big fan of the one to 10, one to 20, one to 50 rule of replacing a founder. I, I, you know, I think from our standpoint, you know, I've, I've been through too many situations where we've been early funders through C rounds, you know, other VCs or PE folks have come in, replaced a founder and, you know, the thing has flown right into a mountain. So, you know, I'm a big fan of that. Now, you know, the question is, is a founder a business person or is the founder a technologist or a clinician? And at the end of the day, um, you know, to all these points, you know, if a clinician is still practicing, they're not on the management team of a, of a company we would get involved in. They can be, if they're still maintaining a practice of any meaningful level, they are an advisor. You know, if they're doing the occasional, you know, high risk brain surgery, because that's what they love to do and they keep their chops and their license and, you know, they're consulting and whatnot, that's great. Maybe they're a chief medical officer. But at the end of the day, you know, we are not going to compete with our capital and their businesses. If, you know, and this is always a great differentiator. We, we saw this historically in the tech business. You know, you have a company that's got a service business, you know, they spun out a piece of technology, they can never let go of their service business. You know, we learned long ago 
that it's a left brain, right brain. If you're not in the pool, you know, cold, warm, whatever, 100%, then we're not writing a check. And, you know, Gary's got a great organization with the acceleration and the help. That's where people like that need to go. And then Gary can, you know, if you will, weed through the, will they let go of their baby? Are they going to be the right folks? But by the time they get to us, that needs to be sorted in our opinion. You know, we'd rather do less deals and have a higher exit percentage, which, you know, we've been either lucky or smart or somehow just navigated that over the years to be able to get to than we would otherwise. Mm -hmm. you, you know, the other thing uh, that I'll bring up is the other side of that coin, which I find interesting. And you, you know, you two probably run into this more, more than I do. And certainly we avoid it like the plague is sometimes I'll get a referral for, you know, for us to look at an investment and I'll sit there. And again, it's my approach. Um, and I'll listen to the pre presentation in the deck and I'm like, there is no doctors on this team. <laughs> and I'm like, there are no clinicians. And who are the advisors that are advising you? And they're working on solutions that clearly intimately interact with clinical workflow. And to me, that's also a non-starter because, you know, I don't know if it's the right word, but it exudes a little bit of arrogance to be able to be a technologist and come up with a solution, but not take that role of looking, you know, looking at the clinical side of it. I mean, we all know the Theranos disaster. If they had had one clinical pathologist on their advisory board, that company would have been dead long before it ever got to where it was. So there is the other side of the coin too. And that's, again, for us, the advantage, you know, we're creating our network agnostically. It's not for our, necessarily just for our fund. So if F or Mary is looking at investment or they make an investment, they can come to me and say, Gary, reach into your pocket of your network and let me know what you have. I need five in cardiologists who are interventionalists who are informaticists. And I can go into my database and provide for them the appropriate advisors, consultants that they need to either do the due diligence or help with the next stage of development. Let's say they're in, you know, they're in the CRO you know, position and they're working with the FDA. So there's that component of it as well, which is equally as important. Well, thank you, Gary and Mary and F. Um, we're about to transition to the Q&A uh, portion of today's uh, conversation. Before we do, I'd like each of you to maybe, if you've got any thoughts or comments that you wanna share, um, give you an opportunity to do so. Also, opportunity to provide your contact information if you wanna be contacted and you know what's the best way to reach you. We'll probably do that one more time before this closes out. Um, but with that in mind, Mary, since I think you started us today, we'll start with you. Sure. Well, it's great to be here and it's wonderful to have such a global audience. I'm excited to get into the Q&A and think about the some of the go-to-market questions about launching in different markets or fundraising internationally in different markets. So excited to get there. I will leave you with my contact info. So we're Bread and Butter Ventures. Our website's breadandbutterventures.com. I wanted to flag that every member of our team does open office hours every week. And it's a wonderful way that we can meet anyone from the world, anywhere in the world is welcome to set up time, get advice, pitch a deal. We've had kids ask us for advice on college uh, navigation. And so, but I, I will note after this event a few months ago in February, I met a tremendous number of really interesting companies. So I welcome the opportunity to, um, to do that. And I'll put my, my info in the chat here as well. Thank you. F? Yeah, certainly. Well, it's a great, it's a great panel. I love it. Great perspectives. Uh, you know, Mary brings an epic one from, you know, outside of our myopic valley, you know, Gary is our epic domain expert, you know, Jason, you know, you shepherd everybody through it. So it's, you know, it's a great panel. Um, you know, what I will say is this is still the greatest time to be an entrepreneur and, and, you know, launch a startup in the history. I did this twice as a young entrepreneur, there were no accelerators, there were no Gary's, there were no Mary's that I could go to and get this level of advice. I mean, this is unheard of. There are accelerators and incubators and, and all kinds of support functions that, that as an entrepreneur, you can get out there today. So today is the greatest time in the history of business as we view it to become an entrepreneur, to try your hand at that. 
you know, and, and there's enough people that can tell you, are you on the right track? Are you not on the right track? What are you going to need to do? And if it doesn't work for you as a human being, then you don't have to do it, right? Gary will tell you, you know, you don't get to run this forever. Mary will tell you at X stage, we, you know, you need a business executive. I mean, there, these are all things that were not decoded when, when I was an entrepreneur and there were never the resources that are out there. You know, this is a great time to do it. So I encourage all entrepreneurs, get out there, do it, you know, learn from your mistakes, get to great people like Mary and Gary, get the feedback and help let that shape what you're doing. Fantastic. Thank you, F. Gary, oh, you're on mute. Okay. Is that better? You hear me? You got okay. it. Yeah. So I, I would echo um, what, what both Mary and F said. You know, for us, it's the whole reason that I started this entire fund and network is that we, we want to promote innovators and, and you know, promote the, the idea of, of creating new ways to provide care to patients. So if you're a clinician or a non-clinician, I would encourage you to join our network, certainly, you know, Global Health Impact Network, which I put the, uh, the link in there, because we provided within that network, and it's free, is to, you know, the entire ecosystem. If you just are a clinician with an idea and you have no idea what to do with it, if you come into our network, we can take you from idea generation. And if it's the right idea, all the way through potentially commercialization. Or if you're an entrepreneur and you already have an idea and you're still a little bit lost and you're looking for, I always joke about this, a friendly group that are your colleagues um, that, that want to work with you, we, we also encourage that as well because we're looking to promote active participation by clinician entrepreneurs and innovators. And that, that's our focus in life. And at the same time, we're completely agnostic, although we have a fund, I think it was said earlier, especially in healthcare, investment in healthcare is a collaborative encounter at the end of the day. And we're, we're working on creating a separate side of our network, which promotes these kind of relationships where if F or Mary have an idea, please bring it to us. We would love to be involved. We likely will make an investment, even if we don't, our, we will provide our network to ensure that 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 company succeeds. So don't be afraid. I've done it. You know, I mean, F has done it. I've done it three times. Um, you know, it's it's doable. Don't be afraid to do it. Just come come in with the right attitude. It's kind of like golf. Don't expect to be, you know, shooting the 70 on day one. It takes a lot of learning and a lot of time and a lot of effort, but it's very rewarding. Unless you're playing mini golf like me. Yeah. Then, then, then I might be able to do better than 70. Uh, no, that's terrific. Thank you very much, Gary, Mary, and F. We're going to pivot to the Q&A uh, portion of today's conversation. So if you've got a question, please use the Q&A function. I know some folks have put questions in the chat box. That's great, but it's pretty long, and I'm the one running the stuff in the background here. So if there are kind of fewer screens for me to monitor, the better. Also, you know, I'm taking some notes and doing some other things. So if I'm not looking at the camera. It's not because the folks here are saying boring things. It's that I'm trying to get us ready for the next part. Um, with that in mind, we may have answered this sort of briefly, but could we just go around the horn real quick? You know, who here invests in early stage startups? Who's kind of at the seed stage and who's kind of at the growth or later? And if you kind of do a blend of that, just, you know, say what, what's your blend, pick your poison. You know, I mean, the flavors have blurred so much, you know, we're late seed series A. I mean, if you don't have customers, if you don't have, you know, uh, referenceable customers, either writing you checks or at the point of writing you checks, you don't have a formed, you know, so, uh, somewhat form management team, you don't have a functional product, you know, you're, you're too early for us. So, you know, you can, you know, you can call it whatever you want to call it today. But if you can't hit those three data points before you walk into our office, you, it, you know, we're, we're certainly sweet and we'll give you good feedback, but you know, there are many other choices out there. Mary? So our focus is seat stage, which we define as live working MVP or minimal viable product in market with a little bit of data under belt. Revenue is not a requirement at that stage. You know, engagement, usage metrics are much more important to us at that stage than revenue. Um, that said, I would say about half of our companies at the time of investment are doing anywhere between 
you know, 10 and 40 K in monthly recurring revenue or monthly revenue, depending on the, the type of business, just to give you a sense of, so it's super early, very, very early. We say our, our biggest criteria at this stage are team, 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 product market traction, which is to show you how much emphasis we put on team at the stage, because we understand it is so critically early and you'll want to prepare at, at seed stage to have a really well thought out plan and, and understand the gaps for the business. So people often ask, you know, at this stage, do I need a business model or do I need a um, financial model? And the answer is yes. And we understand that 90% of the time it will be wrong. That's not where we'll be in two or three years, but it's more of unpacking the founders and the team's thought process, their view of the market, their analysis, and also understanding how ambitious and how aggressively they're thinking. So again, team, 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 product market traction, we're seed stage investors. We do lead rounds. We're happy to we're happy to lead rounds. We're happy to follow other firms' leads as well. Um, and then typical, you know, round size. When, when I say seed, that means so many different things. Usually, we're investing in rounds that are between, you know, one and a half to four million dollars, just to give you a ballpark. Great. Uh, yeah. So for us, you know, because we're a combination of a fund and a network, our approach is a little bit different and, and that also determines where we plug you into our system. From an investment thesis perspective, we tend to go anywhere from pre-seed, which are just the early stage of an innovator having an idea, has started to formulate a team and has an idea about where they want to go with this next aspect of it. If you're before that, we'll plug you into our network and help you, but we won't spend a lot of time on the due diligence side from a, a, a fun perspective. But beyond pre-seed, what we have invested all the way through pre-series A. Um, so we are a little bit all over the map as well. Um, and it just depends on, again, you know, I, I not being a seasoned uh, venture capitalist to be the first time around doing this, I, I, I tend to, as an anesthesiologist, reduce things to the most simplistic approach. So there are, there, there are good management teams and there are not good management teams and there are good ideas and then there are ideas that make no sense. And that's how I look at it. And there's a combination of those. So if you're a good management team with a good idea, we're right behind you. If you're a good idea with a management team that's terrible, we'll pass on that. But if we have a management team that, and we've done this several times now that resulted in an investment, we will work with the management team almost like an innovation hub and say, okay, I'm gonna put you with these three people from our network, start to work with them, get the business plan together, revise your financials, and let's start thinking about, you know, I don't wanna know what's the next three months, I wanna know what's gonna, what you're planning for the next two years. And then we'll reevaluate you and I'll bring in the appropriate people and then potentially we'll invest. And then of course, there's the last category, which none, none of us are gonna invest in. So that tends to be my simplistic approach. We have certainly evolved since then with, as we've grown out our GP and our management group. And now um, moving forward, just for informational purposes, we are now starting a second member fund and a institutional round, which is more along the lines of what F does. So uh, we're starting to now entertain Series A and beyond. So um, we're kind of all over the map right now, but we encourage all comers because of the network side. Thank you. Uh, um, so <clears throat> I'm gonna ask you a question. This question comes in from Andrew Patel, who uh, is a who is a patent attorney, and I've uh, doesn't work in my firm, but I've you know been across the table from him on a number of different things, and I, I think very highly of him. I know he works with a number of entrepreneurs. Um, it's a question that does come up for me uh, sometimes, which is my clients want to know, you know, how much do investors weigh patent portfolios kind of at the stage, you know, depending upon what the stage of the company is at, what is it that you all are looking at? Um, and is there anything from your perspective, you know, on the IP side that, you know, gets deals killed, helps them get through, maybe a war story or two would be great, brief, brief war story or two. Open question for anyone, if it, or I'll call on someone. <laughs> yeah, I'm gonna, I'm gonna pass on that one. Got it. Yeah, it's a tough one. <laughs> I mean, more stories. I'm not as sure. I, I will say that, and maybe it's because of the stage at which we invest. It, we are less. The patent and IP bucket is less of a requirement. Not, not. To, there can be issues there, but as far as do we have patented, protected IP at this stage? 
that's not a huge requirement from our perspective. Where it can get tricky is if, if for example, the technology and the original founders incubated the team, let's say within a corporation, uh, and it was spun out, right? Do then that's we had definitely need to do more diligence there to understand if we have if we have the sole ownership over this IP and if we have or perpetual license or what's the situation there. But in general, you know, on the digital side, it is less of a must have um, and more about the defensibility of the business, the customer acquisition channels, the technology itself. So I mean, that's a, that's a, a quick take. I don't have any, fortunately, I don't have any horror stories yet. Well, so if, if I can maybe just jump in and sort of pick up on what you were saying on the defensive side, because I think that's kind of part of the strategy, right? So depending upon where you're playing, if you're in the digital health side, what you got may or may not be patentable, right? Odds are maybe, maybe you won't be able to get a patent on it. Um, you know, if you're more on the device side of things, maybe you would be able to get a patent on it. So I think it does make sense to connect, you know, uh, with an IP attorney. I'm not an IP attorney. I just connect people to IP attorneys uh, and try and make sure that everything is buttoned up. Uh, but it makes sense to, 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 as part of your strategy, right? Just as you would run, as you're putting together your business plan and you're, you're thinking about what your revenue strategy is and, you know, how you're going to make sure you're who you're pay, who's going to be paying, right? Whether or not you need to get a CMS code, that kind of thing. This is another bucket that you need to bake into your business plan. Um, and I think that's that for the, there are a lot of first time entrepreneurs here. I think that's maybe one framework or one way to take a look at this question. Um, we've got I, a I question. Think one, yeah, go ahead. One other, one other aspect to that also is when it gets a little bit of gray zone, we've looked at companies where they may have IP for, for the one drug that they're looking at. We look, just recently looked at a company that was nanoparticles, but that was not their technology. They were utilizing nano, nanoparticles with certain drugs to improve bioavailability and delivery of the drug. But the question that we had was, well, okay, so we're starting with this drug, but clearly your, 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 your um, commercialization model is to go in with other drugs. If each time you either have to apply for a patent or reapply to the FDA for um, approval because you're now using a new drug, that tends to be a hurdle for us because it's, first of all, it's a difficult model. We don't, and we haven't seen the first one succeed yet. So what we'll do is again, like you said, I'm gonna come to you and say, I need a good IP attorney to look at this and let's make head or tails of this. You know, does it make sense um, to make this investment because we're a 10 year fund. If this is gonna take 15 years to, to come to commercialization, that's not a good investment for us. So that's one way we do look at things. So, uh, can, can the panelists, can you see the questions that they've come in? Oh, so I don't need to uh, necessarily. We can. I, I think it's best if you you curate, Jason. Um, we've got, you know, a few minutes left and yeah. we'll probably want to just kind of zero in on the ones that aren't just specific pitches, if you will. Yeah, yeah, please. Yeah, that's that's what I would do. So, uh, if, is there one on your mind that you want to you want to tackle? No, I'll leave it to you guys. I, I will say that I did see, not in the question and answer, but I was going through the chat session. Somebody asked a question about blockchain in healthcare. I mean, if you're interested, <laughs> I, I mean, I could talk a little bit about that if you want. I don't know if F feels that way, uh, only because somebody well, said a while ago, know, but yeah. I, I mean, you know, we're on the third or fourth coming of blockchain uh, at this point. I mean, we looked at that in 2011, right? I mean, I think when you get into critical systems within the, the healthcare industry, you know, uh, being on the cutting edge is not considered an advantage, number one. Number two, uh, open standards are not necessarily considered effective. Mm -hmm. um, you know, if you, you know, I think people should focus more on solutions and not buzzwords. Um, you know, when, when a clinician uses an EIR or diagnostic tool or piece of software, they don't care if that was written in Java or Cheesecake or Oreo or whatever you want to make <laughs> up. They care that it works. And, you know, it reminds me of the, you know, the, the, the telco industry and the first wave of technology adoption. There's something that we call the five nines. That means you have to be up in operational five nines. That means 99.999%. And when you're dealing with life and death and someone's on an ECMO machine 
And, you know, it's novel to use blockchain to, to, you know, put that into the system. But if there's a burp, if there's a delay, someone dies. And, you know, and knowing so many chief information officers in the medical industry, again, they will always choose something that is rock solid. Because when Gary's got his hands, you know, in a patient and something goes wrong, you know, he is the only one or she as a physician are the only ones that can change it. And you got their job is hard enough as it is to be a novel approach to technology. Gary, do you agree? Yeah, I definitely agree, especially on the clinical side. But it's interesting because, again, I tend to take a different approach in terms of, you know, I, I laugh about it because if you were to query a 10,000 clinicians and say, what is blockchain? The answer you'd get back was Bitcoin. <laughs> they really, I mean, it's not a simple technology to begin with. And, and, and as F says, it, it doesn't, I mean, the value that it would bring on the clinical side is not significant enough to ensure what we're really worried about, which is the clinical provision of care in a safe, efficient manner. Now on the information side of it, I believe that long-term there will be advantages to it, but I just don't think that healthcare is even close to accepting blockchain technology, even look, I ran a, you know, we started a credentialing company, right? And we deal with patient provider data and patient information. And there's always the concern about its credibility, about the safe, the safeness of the transmission of that information. Um, and but it's it's interesting to see how blockchain is being promoted by those organizations that want to promote it in healthcare using all the right keywords, but is there really an advantage to adopting that now when it really adds a lot of uncertainty as no one knows exactly how it works. So um, I would agree with you 100%. I just find it interesting because it's such a hot topic word and, and you know, uh, it, it's being used a lot in healthcare right now. Mary, well, any thoughts or I was gonna segue? Yeah. I'll take a question from uh, the list if, if that's okay. No, that's perfect. I was actually just trying to chat, type in the chat that if anyone has got a you know, question they wanna answer, that's fantastic. Otherwise, a lot of these questions are really very specific. And so I was gonna zoom out and try and get some, some broad questions asked, but if there's one you wanna answer, go for it, Mary. Yeah, super quick. One was a question about, you know, what about for startups who have a prototype in a revenue model and they need funds, where should they go? So just at that earliest, earliest stage, you know, I think before raising institutional capital from, from venture firms, it's best to, it's one really difficult to raise without that proof of concept under belt, but thinking about what's, what's classically called a friends and family round, they're not always your, your actual friends and family. If you're like me, you know, you didn't come from, you're not able to just access broader networks out there like AngelList is a great platform for connecting with people who are broadly interested in specific sectors. Um, you can find a lot of these great syndicates popping up privately in cities all across the country. Here in Minnesota, for example, there's a new group in town called Groove Capital that's investing in, you know, it's the first check fund, literally the first 50K to 100K check into a company. So efforts like that, I would encourage you to, to pull together, scrap together, if you know bootstrapping is an option, if that is an option, but get that first prototype in market, that will make it exponentially easier to access traditional venture capital. And on a related I mean, note, I'll, yeah, go ahead. I was gonna say, I'll jump in on that. So again, um, I, I think, you know, this is not the right group, but again, like Mary said, so for instance, our network, our network, because we have a management company for our venture fund, our management company will work with very early stage startups to create different investment vehicles, whether it's crowdfunding or whether it's uh, an SPV vehicle, which is more of a friends and family. But what you want to do is if you can, and it's not always that easy, one of the advantages of that early seeds, pre-seed stage investment is that you can bring in investors who are strategic investors, right? So if you come to my network and I have 3,000 cardiologists and you have a solution that's in that space, you would like to have 50 cardiologists put in money and be, you know, if you're raising a million dollars, when you come to me or you come to Mary or you come to F and you've gotten to the stage where now you're looking at an investment that we'd be interested in, if I look at you and I see that you have 50 cardiologist investors, I'm going to take a lot 
quicker attention to make a lot quicker attention to what you bring to me than if it's, you know, 30 people from your neighborhood in Moraga. I live in Moraga. I know, so do I. Yeah. <laughs> I'll, uh, take money, I'll take money from the two of you. How about that? <laughs> fair enough, fair enough. Uh, but, but how about in terms of, you know, what have you seen in terms of benefits of, of startups going through incubators, accelerators? I mean, th those are proliferating like mad, you know, and, and now kind of post the pandemic hitting, a lot of them have gone virtual um, and have, you know, and so it's even flatter in that respect. Uh, in terms of you don't have to be physically in San Francisco or in North Carolina if you got one there. I, I have a lot of thoughts here because, you know, wave one, my earlier in my career at Google, Google for Startups, we worked with about 60 of these organizations globally who spanned over 100 countries. And I, I feel like that was the first wave of the accelerator incubator um, groundswell. And now we're at, at sort of the post pandemic, as you said, Jason, with the virtual learn from anywhere. I'm a firm believer they can be extremely useful and valuable. I'm also a believer that there are, it is crowded and there are a lot of them. So if you're considering that, make sure you just do your research and talk to other entrepreneurs who've gone through the program, understand the economics of it, right? You should not be, in my view, you should not be paying money to do something. There should be an exchange of resources that makes sense. And you know, a classic model is a small um, equity stake is taken in exchange for some upfront operating capital that allows you to focus heads down for roughly three-ish months. Um, I'm also a big fan of programs that experiment and push that envelope on the traditional accelerator model. Um, when I was at Google, for example, we created a program called Campus for Moms run out of our campus, which was flip the traditional model where you have to move somewhere for three months. Not everybody can uproot their life. Uh, we instead ran all programming one day a week you brought your babies and your kids with you. We provided childcare, crying rooms, playrooms, feeding rooms, brought the content to you in a condensed way. And so I, you know, there's a lot of great models that are emerging. Just do, do your diligence, make sure that you're, you're, it's both quality education and quality of network. I mean, I'll, I'll say that, and I will admit, we actually on a network site just started in partnership with a, a global capital organization and a virtual accelerator. And it's interesting because I was hesitant about it at first, um, but if you can do it in a way that Mary says, it first of all, it has to be respectful to the companies that you're working with, right? It, it's, not, uh, it's, it's not there to generate revenue for the accelerator, right? It's to help these companies. So you have to be respectful of the fact that these companies that are trying to scale, they don't have a huge amount of time. So unless you're gonna bring information and services that are beneficial to the organizations, it's, it, it's not necessarily a benefit. I also agree, as Mary said, no one should ever be charging a single dollar for any service like that. Yes, there will be some exchange of, uh, of equity in a small way to make sense, but I think one of the things that we're doing, which I think is very important, is in, in the interest of being respectful to the time that, that's available to the CEOs and their founding teams, we're creating it in a way that's both synchronous and asynchronous. And we, because we have a platform that allows that, so we're building it in a way where it's available on demand. We encourage you know, the attendees to participate in everything, but if they can't, they just can participate in what's appropriate for their company. And we bring mentors in and advisors specific to the needs of that organization. So I think they can be beneficial, but what I would say is really, there are so many out there now, do your research. Um, because what really bothers me is when I see accelerators or innovation hubs that are charging startups that barely have any money for services, and then you go look at the individuals who are running them, half of them haven't even ever started a company, um, which is really scary. So, so just be cautious when you choose to do it, but it can be advantageous. Um. I guess in line with that, do your research. Are there some pro tips as to where you can look, who you can talk to, kind of some of that basic background? I mean, I know certainly on the investor side, there's a lot of information that is now out there, whether it's the investor's website, whether the people go on Crunchbase, you know, uh, PitchBook, all those types of things. Same, same sets of resources available for evaluating accelerators, yeah you know, a good place to start even just to get an idea of what a, a, a functional, successful accelerator is, is look at Y Combinator and look at that model. You know, I mean, I think it, you know, it has a good reputation. It's much larger. Um, 
So, and, 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 and just learn, there's so many articles about, I, I've seen a number of articles, as a matter of fact, I think many of them are posted on our network, you know, about how to evaluate an innovation hub or an accelerator and just what to be looking for, for what your needs are. It depends on what your company is doing and what stage you're at. Um, I would also, you know, I'll, 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 I'll say that anyone who wants, if you join our network, there's resources that we can provide you with as well, even if you're making that decision and we're happy to do that. I would say I'm also a big fan of, you know, Techstars, which is scaled globally is a, a great, another great best in class example, but an easy way aside from researching their website, their graduates, where are their graduates now is to just go back online and look at videos of their demo days, because it'll tell you a lot as far as the mission, their thesis, how they're run, the quality of the companies coming out of it. So some super easy, you know, re recon that everyone can do easily. That's a good idea. Great pro tip. Um, so we're, we're kind of winding down and I'm mindful of everyone's time because I, I know you have board meetings and uh, other obligations that you need to get to. Um, maybe we could take another moment or two, just, you know, if anyone needs to say anything or just say their contact information, we can run through it real quick. Um, then we can sign off after that. Mary? Can I, can I start just because I've got to run. So yeah, um, yeah so I, I would encourage, you know, I, anyone that's that in any way shape or form feels like in the healthcare digital space uh, you know needs some help is interested in collaborating with colleagues and and collaborating with the ecosystem necessary to kind of get to the next level i would encourage you to 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 just join our network it's globalhealthimpactnetwork.net um, and you can email me gary at globalhealthimpactnetwork.net i already posted it on the sidebar a couple of times um, and, you know, we, I, I really encourage anyone that's on the fence about it to, 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 to do it, as they say, just do it. And if you need help, feel free to reach out to us. And, you know, Mary and F are also incredible resources. And I think you'll find um, everyone to be uh, very open and helpful. So don't be afraid to reach out. Fantastic. Okay, I'm going to jump. Thanks, guys. Great to see everybody. Great. Thank Bye, you, Gary. Do you want to go? In yeah, the yeah certainly, because yeah. I, I got to jump off in about 30 seconds here. Uh, you know, the best way for us is, is you know, really, we are always posting on LinkedIn, on Twitter, it, you know, particularly in digital health. If you want to know what we're thinking, you know, take your time and look at it there. We do have a web form, but, you know, we are very, very focused on serving the needs of, of, of you know, our LPs and our portfolio companies. There are a lot of great resources out there. Mary particularly is a, as the most gracious of VCs by opening office hours and things like that. Um, you know, we're not, uh, you know, quite as available. I encourage you to follow us on LinkedIn, follow us on Twitter. Those are places, uh, you know, I've got 900 pending LinkedIn invites that one day, you know, I will get through. So please don't be insulted, uh, you know, if we're not there. But follow us at Advanced Ventures on, on LinkedIn. Follow us at Advanced Ventures on Twitter. And those are ways that you're going to be able to understand more about what we're thinking. And, uh, you know, and then the way to get to us is really through people like uh, you, Jason. I mean, you know, it's all about the secure provider network. You know, we view deal flow purely through folks like Mary, Gary, and, and you know, trusted providers like you. Thank you, F. Thank you very much for attending. Mary. Take Good to see you, F. Take care. I get the last word. Um, I'll just. Uh, I'll I'm, I'm glad it is so. Uh, I, I will also probably just sign us off at the very end. But yes, absolutely. The floor is yours. Now, just a quick thank you to everyone for attending from all over the world. Great to be with you. And, you know, I just want to give a strong word of encouragement. Keep on charging and entrepreneurship is, you know, the, the opportunity to pursue your dreams in ways that can truly transform companies, cities, communities, ultimately the world. It's just, it's the greatest gift. And I feel so privileged to be a part of that ecosystem and get to invest and, and back great companies. And so in terms of us, we're, you know, at Bread and Butter VC on Twitter. I'm at Mary Grove. I'm super active on Twitter as far as um, how I get my news, but also I direct message with a ton of people through, through that vehicle. So that's a great way. But again, our open office hours, um, we did just close our first investment from a company we sourced through open office hours. So <laughs> congratulations. That's Thank great. you. It does, uh, it does work. And so just keep on pursuing. I know this is a sometimes frustratingly closed network industry and we're all here to help demystify and hopefully open up that access. So uh, thank you very much.
Oh, wonderful. Well, thank you very much, Mary. I, I also keep office hours so I can identify with you. And I, I find that's very rewarding. If, if nothing else, just being able to help somebody in the ecosystem is fantastic. Anyway, I will close this out. I want to thank Idea to IPO for hosting us today. I want to thank each of our panelists, Mary Grove, Gary Goldman, and Brian Lindenbaum. I want to thank each of our attendees and those of you who are going to be watching us asynchronously. Um, I'm Jason Putnam Gordon at Pulse and Alley, and jgordon at pulseandalley.com is my email. Thank you and have a wonderful day. Get back to building your great company. Take care. Take care, everybody. Bye, Bye now. Bye.